Welcome everyone, everybody online and in person. It's great to see you and we're so thrilled that you're here. On behalf of the Lovers Lane Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Owen Linton Lecture Series. My name is Paul Ditto. I'm the Executive Director of the Lovers Lane Foundation. This lecture series is funded by the Foundation's Owen Linton Lecture Series Permanent Endowment, one of 42 permanent endowments that, that are managed by the Foundation. In 1985, this permanent endowment, the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment, was established by Babs Owen and her late husband, Arch Owen. Thanks to their generosity, this is our 36th annual Owen Linton Lecture Series. And to put it in perspective, I think it's fair to say we actually wouldn't be here today if not for Arch and Babs Owen. Take a look at this video. So yes, indeed, we probably wouldn't be here today were it not for Arch and Babs Owen. Not only are they the founders of the Owen Linton Lecture Series, which brings us here today, they probably more than anyone are responsible for the actual formation of the Lover's Lane Foundation. Babs and our late husband, Arch, joined Lover's Lane Methodist in 1955, 66 years ago. As Babs will tell you, she has many good memories here. Many good memories. Babs wishes she could be here today, but she turned 103 years old just last month. So yes, I can imagine there are many good memories here today. But I bet she's tuning in live on stream and she probably sends her love to everybody as we're speaking right now. Even though she may not be here in person, she's here in spirit. After our church moved to its present location, Arts began thinking we needed a foundation, primarily to help maintain all the new buildings at this location. So in 1981, he spearheaded the formation of the Lover's Lane Foundation as it exists today. And Arts and Babs Owen actually took turns serving as the board chair of the foundation rotating between one another every three years. And the foundation never looked back, growing each year to where we are today. Then in 1985, Babs and Arch launched the idea of the lecture series to be held during Holy Week. And they endowed a permanent endowment to, fu to fund what became known as the Owen Linton Lecture Series. That lecture series really took off when Pastor Stan took an interest in it. For many years now, this endowment has funded the Owen Linton Lecture Series, featuring one or more speakers on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of Holy Week. So yes, indeed, we wouldn't be here today if Arch and Babs Owen hadn't birthed both the Lover's Lane Foundation and the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment. So please join me in thanking Arch and Babs Owen for everything they've done for this church. And I'm thrilled today that we have with us uh, Meredith Simpson, Arch's long-term caregiver that's really gotten her to this point. And um, we're so glad you're here, Meredith. Meredith was kind enough to get me all the pictures that were on that video. Meredith, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you so much. We're really excited about the series this year. Our overall theme <clears throat> is community heroes and Easter faith. <clears throat> we have three awesome speakers. Today we'll hear from Dr. Terry Parsons with his message on the emotional strain of the pandemic. Then tomorrow we'll hear from Ch Chelsea White about food insecurity in our midst. And finally on Thursday, Laura Burnside will close us out with a message about heroes on the front line. And today, as well as tomorrow and Thursday, we'll have a complimentary take-home box lunch for each of you just outside the sanctuary in Aldersgate Hall. So let's get started. Um, Donna, would you open us in prayer? I love what Paul said about Babs and Arch and 
Thank you, Babs and Arch, for making this possible in so many other ways. And thank you, Meredith, for taking such great care of her for over 45 years so that she, it's possible for her to still have a very vital and healthy life. We are thankful. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh, we ask you, Lord God, to prepare our hearts and our minds for Holy Week, to help us be ready to travel with Jesus both emotionally and spiritually, as he is betrayed, denied, arrested, crucified, and then ultimately resurrected. May we too face the reality of his suffering and the struggle that he went through by trusting your plan and your way. May each of us feel on a very deep level the love he showed for us in and through his death. And may our lives be changed this week so that we are compelled to go and share this incredibly good news with others. We pray this in the name of Jesus who lived and died for us all. Amen. scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 121. We're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2. Listen for God's word. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the word of God for the people of God and so we say thanks be to God. Right. Thank you, Stephen and Jimmy and Donna and, uh, and Paul. But I want to especially thank Meredith again. Now, technically, Meredith's been with Babs for 47 years. But Meredith, I want to particularly thank you for that photo that you gave to Paul of Babs and me. I think that photo was taken uh, about six months ago. before the beard anyway. 
Thank you so much for being here, Babs. I think, I mean, uh, uh, Meredith, I think Meredith has probably been here uh, more consistently than anyone in the church because she's here every single year uh, with, uh, with Babs. You know, a few uh, months ago now, we were talking about this lecture series, which is always something we look forward to. We were hoping so much we could be in person, and here we are. I have no doubt that there are more people watching uh, and in person than we've ever had experience in Owen Litton lecture series first day. And I think in large part that's because of the wonderful speaker that we have to address this topic uh, that we have uh, wanted to kind of center our thoughts. And, and the topic really does um, have to do with how we um, as people have, um, have lived into this pandemic and how we've done so by faith. So we're featuring community heroes and Easter faith. Now, Dr. Terry Parsons wouldn't say this of himself. If you know him, you know how humble he is. But truly a hero in our midst, in my opinion, uh, for many years has been Terry Parsons. And I know that in these days of challenge due to the pandemic, his work has uh, really been helpful not only to those who see him in his counseling role, but also those who learn from him as to how they counsel and treat others. Terry, uh, I was pleased to get his newest book, uh, The Intimacy Jungle, that we used, have used here for years uh, with our premarital counseling, and uh, it, we've worn it out. We've used it so much, but his newest um, book is Life-Changing Stories, Reflections of a Seasoned Therapist and seasoned he is. He's one who had his PhD in clinical psychology from Fielding Graduate University in Santa Barbara, California, his master's and doctor of ministry degrees in pastoral counseling from right here at Southern Methodist University, and his undergraduate in history and sociology from Texas A&M University in Commerce, Texas. Terry began his practice here in 1980 uh, he's a, a, a psychological consultant with SMU, uh, Perkins School of Theology, and um, deals with groups there and, and also with interns uh, who come through the seminary and have the privilege of uh, learning from Dr. Parsons. You know, his professional background is that he has been a pastor in a rural parish a youth minister, a drug counselor and researcher, a hospital chaplain at both Parkland and Presbyterian's hospitals here in Dallas, and a minister of pastoral care and counseling at First United Methodist Church in Richardson, Texas, which is his home church. And you will see him in the choir when we see the choir again. Uh, always see Terry and look forward to seeing him there in that role. And perhaps he's in the choir in large part due to the fact that his wife Kathleen is a wonderful musician and a private music teacher and uh, they've been married since 1972. And Terry, that means your 50th is coming up uh, next year. You know, um, Terry has been a friend uh, ever since I came to Dallas. One of the things I always do when I uh, go into a new church is try to find the very best counselors that I can possibly find because I know that my role as a pastor is to make sure that I refer to people who are professionals when that is needed and I can't tell you how many uh, times Terry has, um, has come to the forefront and has helped me with situations uh, that did need his professional touch. Uh, Terry is a, um, a, a truly a Christian in every way. The values that he brings not only to his practice, not only to his teaching, but to his everyday life and his uh, Christian uh, uh, churchmanship uh, are just um, impeccable. So we are so very pleased to have um, Dr. Terry Parsons, United Methodist pastor, a uh, renowned counselor in um, this, this area, and one who we felt like was the perfect one to honor us with his presence and his message today for the Owen Linton Lecture Series. Let's give Terry uh, Parsons a hand. Wow. <laughs> 
Stan, thank you so much for your very gracious uh, introduction, and thank you for inviting me to be here. It's, it's really, really a privilege. And uh, I want to, uh, I, th I think that uh, Stan may have taken my notes. I want to check with him and see if there's a folder that he might have. That's an old clergy trick. <laughs> the old clergy trick, as he said it, right? <laughs> I really thank you now, Stan. <laughs> it's good. And Paul, uh, thank you so much for being so helpful with all the details and everything that has gone into this. I really appreciate that a lot. And for Lover's Lane for hosting this series. And uh, Babs Owen, if you're watching my live stream, uh, thank you and Arch for blessing all of us by sponsoring this series. And I'm just privileged to be a part of it. Really am. And hello to all of you. It is nice to be with you. It's uh, nice to see real people. I see most people I screen uh, these days in my work, so it's really nice to see you, and I welcome those of you who are watching my live stream as well. You know, it's a topic that they asked me to share with you about is emotional strain of the pandemic. Uh, how are you doing? How are you really doing? What have the past 12 or 13 months been like for you? Now, these are the kinds of questions a therapist might ask. Very simply, as therapists, we usually see a person or a couple or a family when they're experiencing a crisis of one sort or another. And these days, we often connect by Zoom and by FaceTime. We provide a safe, and caring environment for people to share their feelings and their situation. We listen well. We ask helpful questions. And then we work together to help those people as they deal with their struggles and their issues and their feelings and what's going on in their lives, and then ways sometimes to survive or to cope or to learn or to grow or change and get better. It is really a privilege to do what we do. We've been called and trained and educated and experienced and dedicated to help other people. And as you might imagine, during this pandemic year, ah, our work has only increased in volume as well as intensity. You and I and people all over the world have had one of the most challenging years of our lives. And although we see signs of things getting better, it is not over yet, as we know. COVID pandemic is a term we had not even heard before last year, and now it is imprinted in our minds and in our histories. You know, we were told that it was just going away. Remember that? It was just going to disappear and go away, and we would all be back in church for Easter last year. To think that a tiny microscopic virus could so rapidly, rapidly spread all over the world and cause so much pain and change and death. Tony and I were talking just before the service. He was telling me about his father's death and memorial service here, I think maybe last week uh, from COVID. And blessings to you, Tony, and, and your family and all who have suffered those, those losses. You know, this has been life-changing for us, hasn't it? It has touched every one of us if it hasn't at least grabbed many of us. How has it affected you? We could, you could think of all these ways in your own mind, but uh, not being able to hug, <laughs> not even being able to shake hands. Graduations with people, many of you may have children or grandchildren. It's been postponed and postponed and weddings have been postponed and postponed, memorial services postponed and limited. And it's been hard to visit people in hospitals and nursing homes, care facilities, and even in home. And then don't you miss having a congregation filled with people and then being able to sing congregational songs? What a year. Global pandemic. Now, we focus about our own stuff that's right here, right now, and we get the numbers about our country. 
But doesn't it blow your mind when you think that it's a global pandemic and what is causing people all over the world? Plus, such divisive political turmoil in our country that divides our nation and, quite frankly, many families. Painful racial strife, economic struggles, and all the things that you can think of in your own individual life that have been challenges. And then we had that freezing weather that affected us in so many ways that it's unlike us to experience here in this part of the world. You know, in one way or another, we've all suffered. This is something we all have in common. And what a devastating combination of calamities. Ah, but you know, this is not normal, is it? This is not normal. People talk about the new normal. I'm not sure about that term. It doesn't fit quite right for me. But this is the time that we're living in. Uh, I want to share with you really from a personal and psychological perspective that, to say that no wonder, as the title for this uh, seminar is, the emotional strain of the pandemic. People suffer in all kinds of ways, all kinds of feelings. And Tony, if you can uh, put up the, on the screen, pandemic feelings, pandemic feelings. Oh, there are all kinds of feelings. And as we look at those feelings, you can identify ones that you may have experienced in this past year. And quite frankly, you can think of them on a scale of zero to 10. How, how tough has it been? 10 meaning the highest. That's really, really affected me. So as we look at those terms, how many of you felt stressed during this time? If you haven't, I want to see if you've got a pulse. Everybody has experienced stress during this, right? Anxiety. Consciously or unconsciously, we've all lived in a higher state of anxiety than we usually feel. Oh. Have you felt worried, scared? These are all fear derivatives, quite frankly. So many people that I get to reach out to one way or the other have felt isolated, isolated, oh. lonely. How many of you felt overwhelmed? Oh, I heard that so early on in the, in the crisis. Oh my, we're changing from this kind of world to this kind of world. Overwhelmed, and people still do. These days, I really hear tired and exhausted. The longer it goes on and on and on. Oh, sad. Grieved, yes. Depressed, many. And some, even suicidal. These are all feelings that many of us have had. And then if you want to look at, you know, how do we deal with these things? So just think with yourself and us, but in your own mind, how well do you think you've coped with this? This is not a test, but your own, just your own little evaluation. How well do you think you've been able to cope with this? Give yourselves credit for being here. Give yourselves credit for surviving and making it, it through these tough times. And then if you think about if you have a high number for a sustained period of time, mm, that, that's when you need to share that with a family member or a friend. Uh, call someone at the church if you've been experiencing these for a period of time, or reach out to a counselor or to a psychologist or to your doctor. There's no reason that you have to suffer alone, that you have to suffer alone. Those of us in helping professions deal with these kinds of things every day with people. This is what we do to a great, great degree. And it's imperative for us, for all of us, and those of us in helping professionals as well, to take care of ourselves. Uh, one of the professional organizations I'm a member of is the American Psychological Association. They have some good research and good publications. A publication I received last week had an article entitled, The Ethical Imperative of Self-Care. It's important for us to be aware of that, isn't it? To take care of ourselves. This is not selfish. It's just important for us to take care of ourselves so we can help other people, whether that's in our families or whether that might be other people that we could reach out to. And as you and I know, Jesus had something to say about that too. Love others as yourself. It is that reciprocity, it's that balance that's important for all of us. Among the people I counsel are over 30 priests and ministers, in addition to the nine interns I have this year. And I serve as their psychological consultant. Now, it's been a whale of a 
stressful time for ministers and churches, hasn't it? <laughs> Those of you, as I deal with and as you know and as you've experienced this, all the changes and all the challenges that people go through. Among the other professionals I would deal with for years, and certainly these days, I see a lot of doctors in therapy. It's by Zoom or FaceTime, of course, and nurses, yeah. Oh, front line, front line, and uh, one of the people has been a young woman. She just turned 23. She graduated from nursing school last year, and she's been on a COVID unit, and she's dealt with that day in, day out, and sadly with a number of the patients dying. And teachers, I don't know, teachers are probably teaching today, but uh, Oh, my gracious, the hybrid model and what it's like back and forth. Many teachers have a lot of stress that they're dealing with. Now, in this uh, time, I've led over uh, 30 Zoom seminars or webinars with a number of congregations, quite frankly, all over the country. It's been interesting. And also with groups like um, parent groups. In fact, Sarah, thank you if you're here around, uh, invited me two or three weeks ago to have uh, seminar regarding parents and, and for that, it's been good. Stephen Ministry Groups. I, I've learned a lot from listening to people in these groups and I have heard hundreds of painful and inspiring stories. Now over the past year, people in our profession have dealt with increasing amounts of family violence, as you can imagine. You read about it, heard about it maybe, but it is real. Drug and alcohol abuse marital conflict, panic attacks, yes, unemployment, severe depression, and suicidal ideation. I meet weekly and monthly with groups of counselors and psychologists where we share with each other confidentially about cases. We share with each other, listen to each other, support each other, and we also try to share some humor, you know, so we have a little mental health fun that helps us. So to continue that kind of lighter mood, I want to share with you a few examples of what I'm going to say is good news. Remember the toilet paper crisis? We may giggle about it now, but it was serious, right? It was very, very serious. During that time, I was counseling with a woman whose husband had died. She was in her 70s. He had had Alzheimer's for years, and you can imagine what life had been like for her. And she was depressed. She was grieving. She was lonely, she was isolating. And we talked about the importance of her being able to safely get up and out. If you think about it, depression is down and in. And so we we're looking at ways maybe she could get up and out. And she decided that she could get up early in the morning, go to a grocery store with her mask on and her gloves on, and that she would get toilet paper and as she called it, fancy water that she would take to the front porches of homebound people that she knew. It was a blessing for her to do this act of kindness. And it was, of course, a blessing for the people who received the goods. And she said, you know, I think my, this would make my dear husband smile to think that I'm getting up and out and doing this. Another example is... Uh, a mom of six children between the ages of two and 12. Now that in of itself says a lot. <laughs> Can you imagine what life is like for her and certainly during this pandemic time? She was stressed, she was overwhelmed, no wonder. And she was caring for, feeding, teaching, doing all these things to help her children with all of their changes. And then one day her children were yelling, we hate COVID, we hate COVID. <laughs> So she stacked up sofa cushions, and they took turns beating and hitting all these things she said on there, we hate COVID, we hate COVID. And they beat on that to release some of their pent up frustration and their anger. And then they finally just lay on the floor and laughed. It was a release. Also, she and her husband were separated when I first met with her. And uh, since that time, they have diligently been working on their relationship, and they're together now. One day I asked them, I said, mm, what do you all do for fun? And they said, well, before we started having children, we used to dance. So they decided 
that they could turn on some music in their living room, listen to some music, and dance. And the children watched, and they had fun. If you want to know what that family is doing every Saturday evening, they dance. Have any of you danced lately? <laughs> it might be good. Some people in the midst of this have come closer to each other and to family and to friends, and some people have done more laughing to just have comic relief. Isn't comic relief important in the midst of tough times? It's not to minimize the seriousness or all the things that go on, but it does help us. Um, a priest of one of the congregations that I did a Zoom seminar with, one of the things we talked about was having some fun. He's a very serious man. So he called one day and said, you know, and that, that fun stuff you were talking about. I said, yeah. He said, you know what I've been watching? Green Acres. Any of you old enough to remember Green Acres? He said, I can watch that silly old, you know, program, and I just laugh. And then the family whose house had burned in the midst of this pandemic, ah, uh, they decided they would watch. Some of you find Tim Conway. Remember Tim Conway? He was just funny. And then uh, uh, the Carol Burnett Show, remember? She said, you know, even their young children, they would laugh and they would have a good time. I think many people have become more intentional about reaching out and touching people's lives that they've not talked with in a while. I find a number of couples and sometimes families or individuals will just take a day trip. They may not want to stay in a hotel, but they can take a day trip safely and have good time. And also, a lot of us have been intentional about growing in our faith, spending more time praying, maybe reading scripture that helps us, devotionals that are important to us, podcasts, listening to good music, meditating, whatever those things are for you and for other people, these are important things. And these days, some of you, I would imagine, you know, are a lot of volunteers. I know it's different now, curbed in some ways, but how many people are helping in food distribution places or where vaccine centers are? See, as a therapist, I'm always fascinated by the things that people can do in the midst of hard times that help them in hard times and grief. It's a way that just helps us to live through it. Now, in the field of counseling and psychology, we also recognize the importance of faith. Even therapists who may not have a whole lot of faith, the publications received, research that's been done, it's important to check with a client, how is your faith? What is your faith like? What is your religious practice? What are things that lift you spiritually and help you? Good studies indicate, as you would imagine, it helps mental and emotional health. Personally, I'm called in both theology and psychology. I think the two go together. And I don't know about you, but I couldn't tell you the number of people, Stan, you probably hear this, Donna, uh, where is God in the midst of all of this? I don't know if that's run through your mind, but I've heard it so many times. Where we're going through a hard, hard time, uh, we wonder where is God, and we want things to get better quickly, usually. Well, we Protestants, I think, are not as visually and viscerally reminded of Jesus' pain, suffering, and death as our Catholic sisters and brothers. Because our crosses don't have a suffering, dying Jesus hanging on them. Now, we know the reason for that. We focus on the resurrection. Thank God for the resurrection, right? And this Holy Week, we look forward to Easter, don't we? We look forward to Easter. That glorious, wonderful, joy-filled time and Easter eggs, probably. And we leave that cross as only a distant and bare reminder of pain, suffering, and death. But may we not forget Good Friday. Good Friday is coming as well. In fact, a number of people I think have felt like this had been a long-term Good Friday that we've been living. Jesus suffered and died with loving compassion. Jesus lived loving compassion. And Jesus taught loving compassion. We all know and remember the Good Samaritan story. The Good Samaritan saw the suffering person, and Luke tells us 
He had compassion for that person. He didn't walk past that suffering person like the religious elite who couldn't be caught touching something like that. No, he had compassion. And by that I mean he saw. He saw what was going on. He saw the suffering. He had compassion. He cared. Then he thought what he could do, and he did it. Isn't that what we are called to do? To see where there is pain and suffering, and to think what we can do, and to do it. And as you and I know, these days in particular, we have a lot of opportunities to live out our compassion. Have you ever had someone to ask you, um, how is it with your soul? I, I hear that from a number of ministers and, and people I know, and they'll just, how is it with your soul? It's a, it's a compassionate term, I think, that they're using to ask that. How is it with you? How is it with your soul? Several years ago, I developed a program I call Soul Sanity. Soul Sanity. And it was for a large gathering of uh, Methodist ministers from around the country for the Large Church Initiative. Remember that, Stan? Now, there were all these important people on that program, and I think the reason they had me on it was because uh, I probably saw more, saw more ministers in therapy than maybe anybody in the country. Soul sanity. And I used that with my uh, interns as well. Where's Stephen? Where's Stephen? You know who read the scripture a while ago? Uh, there you are. Great. Good to see, good to see both of you. <laughs> good. Yeah. Stephen, how's your exercise? All right, good. We, we, the things we look at are um, helping people take care of themselves physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually, vocationally, relationally, really to help them to not burn out during their internship and hopefully things to carry through into ministry so that take care of yourselves. That's really what it's about. So I want to share with you just a small piece of soul sanity, just a small piece of soul sanity. The word sane. Tony, if you'd like to put uh, sane up there, thank you. The word sane comes from the Latin word sanus, S-A-N-U-S, that means health physically and mentally. Now we can expand that to include emotional and spiritual and vocational and relational health. So you can think with me about the word sane. It is good and important for us to have sleep, isn't it? That's one of the things as a therapist I'll ask, how is your sleep? We need sleep to restore and recover. And spiritual life, we've already been talking about attitude. How is your attitude? What lifts your attitude or what helps your mood? In is nutrition. We know the importance of that. Take good care of ourselves. How we have good nutrition, you might say, for our bodies as well as for our minds. Then exercise. It's a good thing for us to do that. Most people I see in therapy, I'm going to say, mm, what kind of movement or exercise do you do? I don't care what it is, but if we will exercise, it's good. If we do these four simple things, it does help us to be saner. It helps us in everyday life, but also it certainly helps us when we're going through such hard times as the pandemic crisis. A theme that we've all experienced during this year, and really it's kind of a topical uh, way of looking at some of the seminars I've done, they're called, like pandemic grief or pandemic stress, or pandemic uh, anxiety. But we always include in that pandemic things like that, but also creating hope, hope. You know, when we're going through a hard time, don't we look for hope? We look for hope. So I want to share with you some words about hope. Uh, I learned uh, some important lessons about hope from the pioneer of uh, grief work, Dr. Elizabeth Huber-Ross. What I learned from her is really imprinted in my mind. And I hope that some of these words about uh, hope will be helpful to you. She did that groundbreaking research and wrote the classic book about grief called On Death and Dying that I'm sure many of you have read maybe time, time, some time ago. I did my residency at Parkland. Uh, many years ago, and my supervisor had worked with Dr. Kubler-Ross uh, at the University of Chicago Medical Center. And one day he said to me, Terry, Elizabeth is coming to Dallas for a speaking engagement. Would you like to pick her up at the airport and, and take her to her speaking engagement? <sighs> yes. I was excited about the opportunity to, to do this. Uh, 
I was working at Parkland, where there's so much suffering and pain and tragedy and death. I needed to learn some about hope. And my, my units were ER, burn, and psych. Yes, I really needed to learn some things about hope. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, hope is the most important thing. No matter what the situation is, you need to look for hope. She cautioned, hope is not always, always what we hoped it would be, or thought it should be, or wanted it to be. But she said, we still always need to look for hope. She looked straight at me and said in her heavy German accent, with a crooked index finger for, for emphasis, but it must be realistic hope. <laughs> Pain, crises, pandemics do not just disappear, do they? It must be realistic hope. Then she said, hope is what you will create. Isn't it amazing the things that people have created or done during this time that's helped us make it through this time? And probably many of you have done as well. Wear masks, right? Wash hands, physically distance, Zoom, FaceTime, call someone who's lonely, reach out to other people with kindness, uh, maybe take something to them and put on their front porch that they would appreciate, and to thank those people who do what they do, whether that's as volunteers or as professionals. You know, it's amazing, the grocery store clerk, the people who pick up our garbage, those who serve on the front lines, aren't we thankful for them? And thankful, be thankful to your church. Let them know. You know, many times people who are ministers and, and work on church, they don't hear from people very much. I, I'm kind of preaching at you, but Stan, you don't mind. Uh, let them know how much you appreciate what they do and what they do behind the scenes that make church go and grow and help so many people. And now, aren't we thankful for vaccines? Aren't we thankful for vaccines? Oh my gosh, for all those researchers, brilliant people who've dedicated their lives to creating these things to help the people who transport it, the people who dispense it and put it in our arm, aren't we thankful for them? I'll put up the next slide, please. Hope is what you will create. At the stoplight, before we got to Dr. Elizabeth Cooter Ross's speaking engagement, she looked at me and she said, uh, ah, hope is what you will create with God's help. She sounded like the emotions of a preacher when she said that to me. Hope is what you will create with God's help. Ah, that's it, isn't it? What God can do, hope is what we will create with God's help. Spring is here. Isn't it wonderful to see it springing up? Ah, oh, vaccines, Easter is coming. God is faithful. God is loving. God is good. And knowing this, let's commit that we, we, with God's help, will help to create hope and good. Show the next screen, please. Knowing what Stephen read a while ago, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Thanks be to God. And please, children of God, let's join with me in saying, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. That was an awesome message. Uh, you know, that's what we need is a message of hope in this time. So very important message to start off our lecture series 
on community heroes and Easter faith. Before I turn it back over to Stan, I wanted to point out um, in your program today, on the inside cover, there's a little blue box inside that page that talks a little bit about the Lover's Lane Foundation. Take a look at it when you have a chance. And there's an insert in your program. One side of the insert is about Babs, and the other side is also about the foundation. So take a minute to look at those. <clears throat> and even more importantly, on the back page of your program is our, Owen Lin is our uh, Holy Week schedule for the remainder of the week. Now, of course, I hope you'll come tomorrow and Thursday here at noon for the remainder of our Owen Linton lecture series, and we'll hope you can join us live and in person Thursday evening for our Monday Thursday concert, The Mystery. And please join us online for our Good Friday service, which starts Friday evening at 7 o'clock. And of course, we hope you'll be here at one of our many Easter services this Sunday. All those services are listed on the back of your program. Remember, box lunches are in the back in Aldersgate Hall for you to grab and take home or take back to work. Um, the box lunches that we have left over, um, they'll be going to Aunt Betty's Pantry at the St. Philip's Community Center. So thank you for coming. Stan, would you close this out? Stan offers our benediction. Oh. We're going to sing together as a congregation. So many of us have been yearning for many months to sing the great hymns of our faith, and this Holy Week we return to that means of grace. So out of love for your neighbor, please keep your mask securely in place. Please stand and turn your attention to the screens and join me in singing the great hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Amen. Now, aren't y'all glad that I got Dr. Parsons back his notes just in time? Thank you so very much, uh, Terry, for that wonderful message and fantastic information that was so hope-filled. I'm leaving here today um, really hope-filled. How about you? I do want to um, invite us back tomorrow. I want to thank Paul and the foundation for all of the good work, the board members who are here, for all of the good work that you do. We are most blessed by this legacy of the Lover's Lane United Methodist Foundation. 
And now as we go forth today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.